Okay, uh, for the Call the Finance Committee meeting of September 15, 2012, reporter at 7.05 p.m. And welcome everybody who's here. And Rag is not here for the thing we just uh, started, so if they haven't done anything. No, go ahead. So, uh, I think that the uh, first item of business, I'm going to shuffle the agenda. No, I guess I won't. I, um, I think we'll start with the FY12 budget results because we have somebody who's uh, unfortunately d just dying to get home. <laughs> um, I have paper copies if people want them. I, I know I email this stuff out, but um, it's a long document, so I figure people. Does anybody else need a paper? Oh, oh, Sure. Um, Do you need a copy? Maybe you pull take two more here. I thought I had that printed out. Okay, I have one more? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, nobody else can ask for a copy now. <laughs> well, um, Happy New Year. <laughs> FY12 has come and gone, and we have our results, uh, which I'll walk through this memo with you. Um, so uh, every year, fiscal year ends on June 30th. Uh, we then close the books, uh, or I should say we, I really mean Sonia and her staff. Um, and uh, what we look at is how our revenue compared to our estimates and how our um, expenditures compared to our budget. Um, and I will walk through what, what that all means. Um, this year was a little bit different, and uh, I will go through it. It's the first paragraph on, on the cover letter here. It was a little different because we had a couple of uh, unique events that made the numbers this year somewhat different, and so if you look in the paper to see what, what's reported, you're going to see a sort of different number than I'm going to talk about here, and I'll explain all that. So, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to please turn to page four. This shows the results of um, our revenues and our expenditures, and um, so you see in the Far left-hand column under budget is the budget as passed by a town meeting uh, a year ago, and um, as you see, the budgeted amount sixty-five million five hundred fifty-five thousand twenty-six dollars is the same for revenues and expenditures. We had a balanced budget to start. That's always how it begins. Then we went through our actual experience, and um, so. Some things came in above our revenue estimates, some things came in below. Um, overall, we generated about a million dollars, a little more than a million dollars in surplus of revenue over what we had anticipated. Um, and I will walk through what some of those areas were. Um, before I do that, I just want to say on the expenditure side, it's the same thing. You see what our estimated expenses were, and then um, what we actually spent and how much of a difference there was there. Um, so uh, let's talk about the big picture and then we'll drill down into some of the detail if that works for you. And as I'm going through this, if there are questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, so the big picture is that uh, if you look at our operations in total, we generated a little more than a million dollars in surplus. And I think the important thing to know is that that number is consistent with the same sort of surplus that we have generated for the last at least six years that, that I know of, uh, maybe, maybe more. The interesting thing is that every year it comes from a different combination of things. So some years that surplus has been mostly uh, revenue surplus as it was this year. A couple of years ago, it was evenly split between expenditure surplus and revenue surplus. So things, you know, are, are in flux from time to time. 
Um, there were a couple of unusual events this year. So if you look at the third column, it says variance favorable or unfavorable. And you look under the expenditures under general government, um, you can see a number of $495,000. That is money that uh, was in the general government budget, but was unspent. And $426,026 of that was the money that was appropriated for the October 2011 snowstorm or ice storm uh, in anticipation of um, maybe needing it to cover um, lagging FEMA reimbursements. In point of fact, the FEMA reimbursements are coming in on time, and so that money is largely unspent. So that is one of the two events that's sort of an anomaly. That sort of thing usually doesn't happen. And at the bottom of that column, you see the $370,000. Um, and that is the money that was appropriated for the Puffer's Pond project. And that appropriation was contingent upon our getting the park grant. We did not get the park grant. And so it automatically reverted uh, to uh, not being expended. So between the two of those, there's about $800,000 that's kicking around that wasn't, uh, wasn't the kind of thing that you usually see. Andy's going to get sick of me hearing this, but I, my analogy is <clears throat> we thought we were going to make a pie. We took a tin of flour out of the pantry. We decided not to make the pie, so now we're putting the flour back in the pantry. So this was money that came out of free cash. We didn't use it, and it's going right back into free cash. Um, so that's why I think looking at the um, adjusted is a little more uh, in keeping with the sort of numbers that you've seen in the past. Uh, it shows that on the expenditure side, within general government, um, we uh, <coughs> spent only $69,000 less than was budgeted. And if you keep in mind the fact that um, most of that, about 62000 of that, was the unspent reserve fund, um, we've spent very close to the, to the limit. So. All right, so I am now then going to turn to the narrative that starts on page two. Can I ask you a really quick question, uh, Ms. Sandy? Certainly. Uh, the variance on uh, excise is pretty large. Is it difficult to ent um, anticipate how much excise you're going to get? Um, the excise has went up this year. Uh, what we do track is um, the size of the average excise bill that we send out, and, and that's because there can be more or fewer cars, but, um, but kind of the age of the car, in other words, the newer cars pay a higher excise bill. Um, so part of that is a result of um, that number trending up over the last couple of years. So the revenue estimates haven't kept pace with the, the activity. And quite frankly, it jumped a lot more than we had anticipated. So that's, that's why it's such a big number. Um, so. There are various ways that we put together these numbers. Um, and so the narrative section, just if you want to look, relates to uh, the revenue numbers that are on page 9. Um, as opposed to the numbers that are on page 4. E each, they're the same numbers, but they're just put together in a slightly different way. And so I'm going to go through the narrative based on what's on page 9. Um, and I won't go through every single number. Um, I've tried to write this as, as clearly as possible, so I assume it's fairly self-explanatory. But I want to hit some of the highlights. So uh, mostly we did well on uh, revenues, but there are a couple of areas where revenues fell short of their projection. And um, two of those have to do with um, LSSE and, and the golf course. So the golf course brought in less revenue than we, we had budgeted to bring in um, by about $25,000. That's the bad news. The good news is that it brought in more money than it um, did the previous year. And if you look at its total expenses and total revenue, it covered its direct costs. So as a there's some indirect costs, some benefits, and so forth 
that are accounted for in the in the general uh, government section that aren't covered. But on an operational basis, if you uh, just look at kind of the day-to-day -day expenses, the golf course did cover its expenses. Um, so from budget point of view, uh, we need to keep looking at that, both in terms of making sure we're putting out realistic revenue estimates and just looking at the operations of the golf course. Um, you know, there are projects, for example, they want to institute a, um, I'd call it a Frisbee golf course, but I'm told that that's a brand name, so I can't Dis say that. Disc golf. A disc <coughs> golf course, thank you very much. Um, although, interestingly, now they're getting some pushback from some of the golfers, and <coughs> I'm not quite sure they want to have Frisbees floating around. So, but, you know, there are things like that. Um, and of course, the golf course is very much dependent on the weather, and so from year to year, I have good years and bad years. <laughs> the next area is uh, LSSC recreation, and really what that is all about is uh, the revolving fund that uh, LSSC uses to run all of its programs, everything from volleyball programs to summer camps and, and so forth and so on. And um, out of the revolving fund and the fees that uh, residents and participants pay, um, LSSE has to pay their um, seasonal workers, you know, uh, the kids who <coughs> coach and so forth and so on, um, and they have to cover uh, ex overhead expenses, the, the salaries and benefits of uh, central LSSE staff. And what happened is they um, more than covered their expenses, but they didn't cover all of their uh, administrative expenses and charges. Um, and quite frankly, they haven't done it for several years in a row. So this is another area that I think we really need to look at to make sure that we have realistic numbers, and also just to look at the operations of some of these programs to make sure that they're offering the kind of programs that are attracting enough people and generating enough revenue. Um, but I would say that that bears watching. The deficit that they had isn't, um, isn't new. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, we should do something about it. Um, the other thing I would notice in, in LSSC is um, swim fees to date where so far we're in, in line with what we thought with the Memorial Pool being open uh, now in the coming year for full season, I would expect to see those go up some. Um, so in future years we may adjust that number somewhat. Um, as long as we're on, on things that sort of lost money, the other one I will mention is investment income. We had a revenue estimate of uh, 110000 and we brought in $79,000. And that really is a direct result of our, um, our rate environment. You know, the interest rate that we are getting from the state MMDT now, the 30-year, excuse me, 30-day interest rate on that is 0.28% or 0.26%, depending on, I mean, it really varies week to week. Um, so, and, we've, and I think, I don't know what Bernanke finally said today, but the rumors were saying that they were going to keep interest rates low through 2015, so I don't think that's, we're going to see a, a change in that. So we're going to have to adjust that going forward to have a more realistic revenue estimate. You're going to have to start buying naked puts. <laughs> right. Boost that a little bit. Well, we, we could try that. All right, so on the positive side, there are other things. Um, I have one question about the golf course. Um, yes. Were the revenue uh, expectations uh, aggressive? Um, you know, the Hickory was closed for a while, for the whole of spring, so that should have boosted our revenues. On well, as I said, their revenues were higher this year than they had been last year. Yeah, but our so expectations were aggressive. I think I think we probably were a little aggressive, and so we'll have to look at that when we set okay. a, a budget for, uh, for FY14. Um, fines and forfeitures uh, were up substantially, um, almost um, $90,000. Some of that is a little bit anomalous because the, um, the way the court is giving us fines and forfeitures now, they're just giving us one lump check as opposed to um, our being able to get more detailed information about what our town of Amherst bylaws, in infractions versus uh, other things. 
Um, so while it was a good number, I th we're going to be working with them to try to get them to, to change how they give us our money back and, and that money may go down some. Uh, licenses and permits um, were above estimates, which I thought was very good, particularly since building permits were below expectations, but um, we got a couple of big electrical permits from UMass, and so that brought us in over our revenue estimate. Um, miscellaneous uh, non-recurring is um, mostly what's called the Hopkinton Bill. Um, there's a small surplus there. As Anurag pointed out, a motor vehicle excise, we had a substantial surplus there. Um, and other departmental revenue, um, there was a, a, um, a major turn back there, 347000 and it really has to do with some what I might call one-time events. Premiums on bonds that we sold when we go to the bond market, it's, you know, it's an auction, and what people bid um, sometimes contains something called a premium. It's, it's a way of adjusting what you pay to versus what the face value of the bond is versus what your real return is. Um, anyway, uh, we did get a premium. You don't know if you're going to get a premium when you, when you go to market. And so some years we do and some years we don't. Um, and we got some pretty good revenue from our um, Medicaid reimbursement, which is uh, something that is really for services that are provided mostly to the schools. Um, and then we apply for reimbursement and the, and the town gets money. A particular interest, I think, in terms of the result of policies, decisions, are the results of the meals tax and the hotel and the hotel tax. Um, the meals tax uh, did quite well, $64,000 over our estimate, and um, I think it just goes to show that the town's restaurants have been doing well and they have a few um, new ones. The hotel motel tax was slightly above estimate, but you have to, have to consider that the Lord Jeff was open for only half a year. I think we're going to continue to see that rise. Um, the other things, uh, penalties and interest, um, there was a surplus on that, although the number that came in is, is very much consistent with what we've budgeted in previous years. It's just we've always sort of under-budgeted that, uh, under, un underestimated it. Um, and then uh, pilots are really just kind of ongoing. That's I don't know if it's material or significant. It is. I have a question about pilots. Go right ahead. Um, the things you list there are the main sources of the payments in lieu of taxes. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing from the colleges or the university counted in there. There's ninety thousand dollars from Amherst College that's okay. in there. When do you receive that commitment? Um, we usually get that uh, near the end of the fiscal year. Um, John makes a little trip over to the president's office. <laughs> and, and so has that trip been made this year? Yes, we got the, we, we got the money for, for FY12. It was in. Well, and, and, so, okay. um, and then state aid, there was a surplus there. If you remember, a year ago, we had some one-time money from a $65 million distribution of state aid. We appropriated 400000 of that into the stabilization fund, and there's 114 that was left over. Um, and that uh, was just came back as free cash. Hopefully it'll come back as free cash. Um, on the expenditure side, uh, we expended 99.87% of our budget, if you discount those, the storm and the puffer's pond money. Um, so that's very tight. Um, if you look back five or six years ago, the amount of turnbacks was was consistent with this. In other words, we were we were spending a pretty high then. So it's not unusual for the for the town to experience um, that kind of rubbing two nickels together kind of, of budgeting and, and expenditures. Um, so. Um, all departments were, were very close to their budgets. Um, so if I would just say in general government, if you discount what was left over in reserve fund, there was $6,900 unspent. Um, public safety came in very, very tight. Um, public works uh, ended up with a small surplus, and mostly because we didn't, after the October storm, we really didn't have a lot of snow and ice for the winter. Um, 
Planning and Conservation came in within $762. Uh, and Community Services, um, that came with a small positive, but you have to keep in mind that we had to supplement that with $37,000 for the um, Veteran Services budget. That is the general fund. Um, the enterprise funds all had positive results. The, the numbers are on um, pages starting on um, page 6, 7, 8, 8, 9. Um, so, excuse me, page 5 is the sewer fund. There's an overall positive uh, result of um, $247,000. Uh, page six is the water fund, $113,000 positive result. The solid waste fund at a $6,000 surplus, which is very good. Amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and um, then the, the real problem this year has been the transportation fund. Um, we had a, a shortfall of $80,000 in our revenue estimate. Um, that was made up by not spending $42,000 uh, below our, our budgeted amount. But it really has to do with the implementation issues with the new parking system. Um, so some of this is a result of people putting less money in the meters than we thought they would. But probably the bigger impact is that because there were implementation issues and the parking enforcement officers either had to be working literally on the meters to try to fix them or they knew that the meters weren't um, reporting accurately, they just didn't write tickets. So it's the ticket revenue that is really down. Um, and um, this has been a subject of substantial discussion before the select board and internally with staff. Um, and I think we've made a lot of progress to get the system uh, up and running better and there are some improvements that we see coming in October in terms of upgrading the communication system that I think will also have uh, an impact. Um, but it bears watching and it definitely is an issue of um, having to work quite diligently to make sure the system performs the way we expect it to, which unfortunately to date that quite frankly has not. And are there questions wow. or comments? Well, good run through. <laughs> Clearly we want to invest in the sewer. That's the yeah, right business proposition in town. Exactly. Well they are flush with cash. <laughs> <laughs> in the minutes? Flush is a good choice of words. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for the report and uh, for the good work and uh, nice to have uh, solid positive numbers to work with, which we will be talking about again in a few minutes. Um, we get into the later part of the agenda as to where this goes, but uh, uh, it's helpful to uh, this helps with FY12. For people who are watching on the Amherst Media, where this is, of course, will, you will not be seeing this live as it happens. If you're a member of town meeting, the report that uh, we were just discussing is being mailed to all town meeting members uh, probably within the next few days. And uh, there will be a cover memo from me as chair of the finance committee um, explaining a little bit of the background and perspective to um, help understand that. Uh, for people who are watching at home and who are not members of town meeting, um, it, it should be on the website if it's not already, because um, it was on the select board packet section already, and it should be, I assume, on the finance section. Um, I believe it is, but um, after tonight we'll make sure I've got my list of documents that we're using today and make sure that they'll be posted. So um, you can, if you've been watching at home and you're interested in seeing the report, uh, 
find copies either as town meeting members in paper or otherwise online. Um, so, last chance for questions. And, uh, so, thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, Sandy, uh, I'll just stick with it because I think that the next item is probably brief. Is there any news affecting budget that, uh, other than what we just discussed? No, there, there really isn't. Um, we've closed to FY12. We're looking forward to make predictions on FY14. And we'll talk a little bit about, in a minute, about what to do about and kind of finishing off FY13. But there's really nothing other than yeah. that to discuss. And uh, the only FY13 news that people may have uh, read in the Gazette and otherwise heard about is that the regional schools adhered to a promise that they made at a four town meeting that if uh, there was an excess of uh, Chapter 78 received to the region that they would distribute it back to the towns uh, by reducing assessments for the year that just began on July 1st, which is the FY13. And uh, so that's really an FY13 issue, which is why it was not discussed in the FY12 report. Uh, so that brings us to uh, the next item, and uh, which is the report from uh, subcommittee regarding investment policy and discussion of the investment policy. And uh, so, um, I have a draft, a copies of the draft investment policy. For anybody who wants them. This is another item that presumably will be available for people watching at home at some point on the website, it's going to be a part of the, if it's adopted, it will be a part of the financial policies of the town, which are, are, are on the Several web already. Places on the website. Um, <clears throat> so, just to recap, we, um, last year, Claire McGinnis, the treasurer collector, um, and I worked on uh, drafting an investment policy, and um, it is what you have before you. Um, we looked at investment policies of other, uh, what I'd say are well-run communities, um, as well as looking at some of the models that the Government Finance Officers Association puts out and incorporated it into, into this. Um, and so what I'd like to do tonight um, is, Claire and I put this together. Um, we met with Anurag. Um, Tuesday to go over this, um, incorporated some of his helpful suggestions into this and into a um, memo that Claire's going to go through with you, kind of showing how she takes these principles and puts them into action when she uh, invests the town's money. Um, but what I thought I would do first is just give um, a little overview of what this policy is and, and why we have it, and then we can get into some of the nitty-gritty as to how it works. You only have a fresh copy. Yes. Thank you. Um, so there's um, the overarching principle of an investment policy uh, is to maintain safety, liquidity, and yield. So the uh, foremost thing is you make sure that your money is safe, Two, that it's liquid, uh, in other words, that you can get at it. Um, so it's in instruments that you can, um, you can quickly access. And then yield is uh, another word for what sort of interest you're earning on it. Um, and all that is set out quite clearly in Massachusetts General Law. Uh, Chapter 44, Section 55B uh, requires uh, Municipal treasurers to invest their funds and keep in keeping with these principles. Um, and so, a couple of things I just want to point about out about these these ideas. One is that um, 
safety, and Claire will go through this in a little bit more detail when she goes through her, her memo and shows you her sheets. Um, safety is a matter of making sure that you're putting your money in institutions that are, um, that are rated as safe, um, that you don't put all your money in one basket that you, um, you know, distribute in one. Uh, different institutions that, where possible, you either have um, insurance on that money through the FDIC, or there's a state equivalent of the FDIC that has insurance, just like you do for your, your own accounts. Um, and, um, or you do these things called collateralization agreements, where if, um, if I give you money, you then have to have an equivalent amount of money invested in something that we both know is safe, that isn't in your bank, but is in, in, a, in a highly rated uh, instrument. That's what collateralization is. Um, liquidity uh, really is a matter of, in state law, for most of our day-to-day -day cash, we can't invest in anything that has a term of more than a year. So it has to be liquid. and and so. It varies from um, bank accounts to money market funds, but there are things that are, that are liquid. Um, and then yield really is a matter of um, the process that Claire goes through in selecting accounts, um, either through a formal bid process or just making calls around to see, or sometimes just happened the other day, we, we, we knew about a, a bank that would, had given another town a pretty good rate on something, and so we called them up and said, hey, if you gave them that good rate, what are you going to give us? You know, so it's just sometimes like that. Um, so the first part of this memo outlines those principles and then talks about how we invest our general funds, our special revenue funds, and our enterprise funds. In other words, uh, what I would might think of the things that aren't trust funds or, or stabilization funds, but there are kind of everyday cash. Okay, I have one yeah. question before you get to the investment issues. And that was the last paragraph of that section. Oh, um, yes. Where possible funds may be invested for the betterment of the local economy or that of local entities within the state. And that comes after the other three, right? Right. That, that is right. Yes. I, I, and I think it... The it, other three are the most, most important. And in fact, I, I, we almost put something like, you know, consistent with the principles above. Or, and, and in fact, if there are, if there's wording here that you think needs to be changed or clarified or strengthened, you know, we're, there's no pride of authorship here. We're definitely yeah. open to that suggestion. It would be, I don't know, it just seems to me where it doesn't, you might say something like where it doesn't conflict with maintaining safety, liquidity, and yield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There may be some benefit to ambiguity out there. But I guess that the uh, everything we do has to be consistent with Chapter Forty Four Fifty Five B, and so that the principles that we're just discussing of safety, liquidity, and yield as being primary considerations have to be met as a matter of what the statute. Um, instructs us to do, sort of, sort of saying, consistent with our obligation, when consistent with our obligation to um, adhere to the requirements of the statute and the factors to consider, if it's possible, then we may do this. Yes, and in fact, as Claire will show you in, in a minute, um, and as we talked about at town meeting, the result of our normal operations has been that we invest most of our money in local banks and Massachusetts banks, and, and that, so in point of fact, um, while adhering to safety, liquidity, and yield, we also have, on an operational basis, have ended up investing locally um, substantially. So again, Claire will have some numbers to, to back that up. I must mention that safety, liquidity, and yield add up to SLY. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> um. Um, the next thing is just a list of the 
uh, instruments that um, are legal for us to invest in, um, whether it's MMDT, which is basically the big money market account that the, the state operates, um, U.S. Treasuries, bank accounts, or certificates of deposits. Um, we, in fact, don't really invest in treasuries or U.S. agency obligations, although we're legally allowed to. We do have bank accounts and certificates of deposits. Um, and um, I don't keep going there. Uh, diversification. Um, so we do try to um, diversify by maturity date. So not everything comes due at the same time, and not everything is going to same kind of economic cycle. Uh, the type of um, instrument, again, whether it's sort of like a money market or a, um, a CD or bank account, and uh, diversity among issuers. Um, we make clear that the treasurer is authorized to invest consistent with state law, um, that the treasurer engages in um, upholding stand ethical standards, um, and that we use, uh, number G refers to the fact that we use a um, bank rating service to select our banks that, that we we didn't used to do that. We started doing that about a year and a half ago. Um, and um, Claire can explain how that works. Um, and then just being clear about um, the treasurer's ability to report those things, and you'll see that from Claire. So that's for basically our cash. Um, then there are other um, instruments um, where there are other laws that allow us to invest funds. Um, and um, so there's slightly different rules. We can invest in longer term instruments, particularly on trust funds. Um, there's something called a legal list, which is uh, available at this very long site here. Is it working this afternoon? Oh, really? We, we can double check it. You just said that page was not available. Yeah. Well, we will check and make sure they have a change. Um, also, with some of our funds, like our stabilization fund, we use a broker to handle those. Um, so we give our money over to somebody to, to invest. And so we do have standards as to um, how we, um, what their qualifications have to be. Do you want a technical correction? Sure. On page four, stabilization, second line. It should just be one town, right? Not towns. Ten so percent of the, of the, it, it should be uh, an apostrophe. Oh. That would mean to be capitalized, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What? Uh, Is that it now? Right? Five. Yeah, but what follows towns? Validation of the really? towns, what? Of the oh, 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 actually, it, you know where? It, of the town, it should just be town. Town, town. Yeah. Yeah. Because value of the town, I'm sorry. Claire, do you want to add anything else about the policy it, itself? Um, I, it's just a glossary at the end and some explanation of what arbitrage is, which I won't try to explain. <coughs> All right. Any questions so far? Well, I, I guess the thing that I was uh, wondering about is um, this gets into the whole thing of uh, what we do when we have a broker, and you just mentioned the fact that we have to use a broker for one area. Uh, Brokers make recommendations, but clients make judgments about whether to accept the recommendations that the broker makes. And um, I assume that the client is uh, the town being acted upon, uh, with the treasurers making that decision as to whether to she accept. She's the custodian that. of the funds, and she makes the ultimate decisions based on those recommendations. And. Um, but there are no other guidelines or limits that we have or want to suggest for um, 
the types of investments that or the criteria, how to apply uh, recommendations of a broker? Um, I think, well, generally the standard there is the kind of a prudent person rule standard for, for those investments. How you then break that, yeah. right? So I, I think that, that that's frankly the level at which it, it, should, it should remain. Okay. Just to clarify this, um, this section on broker qualifications, and in fact, most of this it does not apply, am I right, to the library, Jones Library Endowment? No, because the That's Jones Library true. Endowment is the um, property of the Jones Library. Right. Now, in point of fact, they do have a they basically have a similar arrangement to ours. Gage Wiley is a broker mm -hmm. and manages their, their funds for them in the same way that ours does for, for, our, um, for our funds. The one thing that isn't here, as I've been talking and thinking about this over the last few days, that isn't explicit, and I think at some point we would want to expand on this, is um, as we start to put money into an OPEF fund, we should incorporate that into the, these policies. Um, but we'll save that for another day. But I just want to flag that as an issue because at some point that's going to be the town's largest asset, or at least uh, financial asset. We're right now, town's largest liability. Yeah. <laughs> Claire, do you want to go through first time? This is Sandy and uh, is close to getting ready. Um, we have a section on trust funds that begins in my copy on the bottom page four, top of page five. Um, but then it, uh, page four? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, section two. Then subpart C. Mm -hmm. So, why would the um, OPEP trust not be a trust? It is, it's just um, has different legal authority for establishing it and for the rules for investment. It's under um, section 20 of, I think it's, it might be chapter 44, I forget, but whatever. When, we, when the town meeting voted to accept the, yeah. it, it just has uh, a different, um, and it's not, it is not subject to a legal list. It is, um, it is a prudent person a standard um, explicitly in that general law that we accept. Yeah, because at the end, under the definitions, there's town trust funds as one of the definitions, and it's gifts and donations accepted by the select board of families given to the town through trust or in perpetuity agreements. Um, and I actually wrote down the word OPEB next to it. Um, so I was thinking along the same lines. It probably, um, something we should consider is we're doing this policy is to very be more explicit in um, subsection C of section 2 of saying that um, this does not include OPEB and then have OPEB be a part of the second because uh, it, it could create confusion for people down the line who are aware of the OPEB trust, especially since we're going to be discussing OPEB trust in a little bit. Yeah, I, I think at some point, what I was thinking is that we would put in an, another section, whether it's, you know, E or D or, you know, what, whatever, between, after C, that is explicit as the OPEB in and of itself. Um, and we could, um, yeah, that's just a timing issue as, as, as to when we... Yeah. No, it's just a question of whether there should be, you want to put some clarification for now and see that it's not including the um, OPEB trust. Uh, the um, 
because otherwise people have to go back to the definition section and sort of back it out and sort of be a little more explicit on that. Uh, the other thing is on just an editorial observation on section two, instead of scope being just stuck there, should probably should have a subsection A with it. This my copy does not. Oh, it came out differently in yours. Okay, thank you. I'll take a note of that. Um, here, why don't I make sure you have it? We made some uh, adjustments after we met the Anurag, and so I just want to make sure you have the latest copy there. Okay. I think that's good feedback that the um, <coughs> trust fund's definition should be more explicit, because not only will we add OPEB eventually, but I also just learned that the health care claims, I can never do that quickly, <laughs> trust fund is subject to laws much more like stabilization than general fund. Mm -hmm. So it could also be called out individually and managed um, slightly differently than it is now. Okay, so if, um, if that kind of wraps it up for the document, um, I've circulated a cover memo and then lots of pages of numbers. Um, what the policy really attempts to address is uh, recommendations we've had in our annual audit, as well as to provide some real guidelines for the treasurer making these daily decisions. Um, Sandy and I have spent about a year working on this policy, trying to capture the actual process that we use here in Amherst, as well as to keep the best of those common elements we found from other cities and towns. Um, I do hope that the document was readable and that the concepts were accessible uh, through that effort. So in the cover memo um, is another way to sort of try to address um, these three concepts, safety, liquidity, and yield, which guide the treasurer and provide the framework for defining risk and also lead us to some metrics. Um, credit risk is the risk of an issuer defaulting. This is all about safety. Uh, Sandy's mentioned insurance limits, um, comparing our assets to an issuer's total assets as a measure of safety, uh, that we'll screen our issuers using a rating guide, and that we'll limit any uninsured assets in aggregate to 10% of cash on hand. Staggering maturities addresses both liquidity and yield, and in some ways interest rate, rate risk, so that changes in market rates make, um, are less likely to make our investments less valuable. Uh, and as Sandy also mentioned, by law, general funds are limited to less than a year, uh, dep term deposits of less than a year. We look for diversification of maturities, types of investment interest, and also by issuer. Again, this gets to safety. Um, it also starts to get to yield that we try not to, um, we try to keep our funds moving around so that um, bankers are motivated to give us a nice yield. And we, as we also talked about, another um, element of risk and safety is that custodial, and that we try to bring a broker in and keep a broker who um, meets all our requirements for both reporting safety and um, everything else we need for him. So I tried to make this chart um, link, provide a link between some of the crazy numbers we're about to look at and the, the way this is laid out in text. And I hope that that uh, provides a bridge for you, maybe as you consider it later on. Your first page of numbers you're familiar with because we looked at it in the spring. Um, Sandy asked that I update it, which I have done for tonight. What we didn't really talk about too much in the spring, which I'll draw your attention to now, is that security column. Um, and that's the rating from Verbank, which is the rating um, service that I subscribe to and use um, to decide who we do business with. So they, rain all, they rate all banks, yellow, green, red, green being the highest rating. Then I guess they decided that wasn't quite enough because everybody was green. 
so they established a star system. There's one, two, and three stars, three stars being the highest. The Bs um, stand for a blue ribbon bank, which is yet another sort of um, accomplishment they tack on to the three stars. Excuse me, why is there only one B at the first, for the first one? Is it a typo or should it be a BB? It really is a B. Oh, it is it. a B. Yeah, but he's, he stands in savings bank and he's fully insured up to $5 million. So Greenfield has two Bs, what does that mean? Uh, it means they've been blue ribbon for more than one quarter consecutively. So it's to be or not to be. Shameless. Just couldn't let it go. Do you want to ask that question? No. Okay. A comment for I you. apologize for reading for reading over your shoulder. Um, she's written, what is the highest rating? And uh, it is the green triple B. Oh, triple B. Triple star with double B. That is the, that is the highest rating. So green field had a highest rating. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions about that? What is Abbey Capital? Abbey Capital is the broker that manages our trust and stabilization fund. Out of Boston? Yes. Why are things not rated? Why are these these two not rated? MMDT is not rated because it's the state municipal pool. So it's not a it's not a bank. It's not a bank in that sense. So it's it just it's not covered in the rating service. Um, and similarly, Abbey Capital is not rated because he's a broker. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the next, uh, the first page of really um, nitty gritty numbers shows you where our general funds are. Um, it also shows you the mix of term deposits and liquid deposits that we have. It also shows you what kind of insurance or collateralization we have with that institution and the current yield for those accounts. What is a letter of credit? A letter, of, le or letter of, I guess that's credit. A letter of credit is another form of collateralization where TD Bank has um, extended the same amount of money to a partner, they, a bank they partner with in Missouri, to cover our deposit if they should have the default. Thank you. Ready for page two? So page two takes that same information of where our money is housed and sorts in several ways as described in the investment policy so that we can see how well we're doing with our metrics. Cash on hand by institution shows how well our balances fall within the insurance limits. That's the first column called creditor. Uh, red, we're over the insurance limit. Yellow, we're getting close. And green means that we're just fine. Um, Again, the insurance ceiling is that the next column over, so you can see with TD mm -hmm. Bank, the insurance limit is $4 million and we're over by 2,107. And the red with People's United is um, the result of the amount, the, just the volume of transactions we put through there. That is where we have our most active checking accounts for payroll and accounts payable, and although they're a local bank, they were Bank of Western Mass when they won the RFP to be our uh, busiest and to manage our operation. Um, pretty much every warrant that comes through the town is more than $500,000. So it is over their insurance limit, but um, they're a very safe bank and we're pretty comfortable having our money there. Um, so even though it's red, it's um, with good reason, and we understand why. If I may, Andy. Yeah, Just ahead. to follow up on that. So it, it, in a sense, 
Am I understand it with that particular account that we're we're turning dollars in and out of there quite a bit is the idea. So it's exactly. the fact that it's over by a large amount. There are times though that it's below that because we've written a bunch of checks basically, and you know a payroll goes through or whatever, and it lowers the, the overall deposit and sort of right. shifts around right. quite a bit. Right. The balance varies the, considerably. The, I would right. guess we every time we issue a raft of checks, we have to move money in there to cover them. Right. So it's so when you know. The following Friday or the following Thursday night, when we're about to issue checks, is when it will come down again. Right. Because most everything is cleared. Um, and I guess just a point of interest, if anyone finds it interesting, it will be this January and February that we have to go back out to bid for that operation. So that, um, every three years we go back to go out to bid for a contract of that size. In the next section, you can see cash on hand by category, and this goes back to those categories of instruments we're allowed to be in, in Section C. Um, as Sandy mentioned, we don't use U.S. Treasuries or U.S. agency obligations. We do have money in the MMD state pool. We actually have as little money, um, I think, as we ever have had in there because their rates are just not keeping up with what I can get at some of the other banks around. We do have two accounts set up with collateralization um, type agreements, totaling 40% of the portfolio. And you can see that as category four. And we have 43% of our cash on hand invested within the insurance limits of FDIC and DIF. In aggregate, our funds um, <coughs> that exceed the insurance limits or, or are in accounts with no insurance is at 1%, and the investment policy has a 10% uh, metric. Claire, I'm just curious. Uh, the, the liquid deposits, the amounts, do they correspond with any departments, or are, are they are they done on a negotiated basis when you can get a rate and that you have free cash and you put it in there, or they correspond to some kind of operating uh, <coughs> unit. The only thing you could equate to an operating unit is that um, four million dollars at TD Bank is last year's bond proceeds for Guilford to do okay. capital improvements okay. right. um, to a water treatment <coughs> plant. The rest of it is all general fund money, um, and it's it's all liquid. It's literally just guided by where I can try to make a little money in these incredibly lousy interest rate times. I mean, I guess the real question is, how do you know where you're going to write a check from? <laughs> I mean, which of these which of these accounts do you do they the checkbooks reside somewhere? The checkbooks all reside at People's United. I got you. That's your liquid account. So right. to replenish and um, meet our liquidity, I make transfers out of these. We make wire out transfers out. from all right. the others into. Understood. What bank was that? People's United Bank. Thank you. You're welcome. I just thought of something as you were going through the banks, and uh, every year we ask town meeting to authorize mm -hmm. treasurer to. Um, cons consider compensating balances mm -hmm. uh, in banking arrangements. And I think the question came up last year um, as to whether there were any, and the answer I believe was no, at least at the time that the question was asked. Um, but uh, it sort of just dawned on me when I was piecing all of that together in my head a second ago is that we didn't put anything about that element into the investment policy, I don't think. Um, no, we mentioned collateralization and we mentioned insurance. Um, we could add comp compensating balances as a, um, as a tool. Just a quick question. Uh, the money market funds, yeah, you know, obviously money market funds are, were you affected by these um, in the, during the crisis? How do you mean? I mean, there was some 
freezing of the money markets happening. Oh, where, where some of them went below their par or yeah. you know, their... Yeah, what are the effect of that is. Um, I think the, well, the biggest one is MMDT, and, and no, I don't think that was affected by, um, by that. It, because that's that's a really a state-run fund as opposed to a sure. a true money you know it's going to Dreyfus or Fidelity or something yeah. like that. Although, ironically, Fidelity had been the outfit running the MMDT, and now they've Steve Grossman has put it out to bid, and somebody else is going to run it yeah. now. I forget who it is. But the short answer to your question is no. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. I'm I'm just kind of curious, you know, just. Uh, there are what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that a reason for nine versus say five or six or fifteen? Because you know some of them are really small. You know, like the first three are fairly small compared to the other ones. So, is there any benefit to consolidating them just for you know? The, I, I'm just following up on what Bob was saying earlier that you know. With so much information out there, it, it's kind of hard to keep track, maybe. So the first three in the list are um, are really there for convenience as money market funds. Those banks um, will quote us a nice rate on a term CD. Hmm. And to get money in and out of a CD, having um, an account sitting next to it that's easy to get money in and out of, um, okay. facilitates that. So they're, they're pretty low balances. Um, we try to keep the real money earning interest either in a term deposit or in one of the better paying um, bank accounts. Okay. So that was cash on hand by category and the 10% rule, um, which Okay, so the other um, metric that I didn't talk about is um, in the upper section of cash on hand by institution, and that is this 2% rule, the concept being that the value of our ship deposits in any institution should not exceed 2% of the total value of that institution. So we shouldn't um, be worth, we don't want to be in for more than 2% of what they're worth. Um, I get the institution's total assets from the same bank ratings report and plug them in there once a quarter. Uh, we don't even come close. We would have to um, far exceed the insurance limit that we're allowed to be able to do that with any one of the institutions that we work with. But that 2% that uh, investment policy rule refers to the, um, the value of our set assets in comparison to the total capital of the bank. So basically it means that our money is a rounding error for them. That doesn't sound good, though. <laughs> okay. I like the way I said it better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as you've talked about, um, also, and the investment policy also talks about, we do have funds outside of the general fund in stabilization, health claims trust, and some trust funds for scholarships and um, other small things. They are addressed by the investment policy, and they are also managed with the same attention to safety, liquidity, and yield. Um, and those are described in the very bottom of that last chart. Which is what I had prepared for you to <coughs> review this, if there are any other questions. Just to clarify the last column. The that's, last section. That's referring to the numbers under in, uh, in policy C investment instruments. The yes. Sections. Yeah. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, in our, we didn't really have a subcommittee despite what our agenda says. We did ask one member of the committee on behalf of the board to meet with uh, Aaron, Sandy, and uh, in our volunteer to do that. So I was wondering if you had anything additional to report to the back since you were the one who did that. Well, we met on Tuesday and uh, went over this. I think that um, the only uh, thing that 
jumped up at me at that time was to uh, see the match uh, between the policies and the execution of those as closely as possible. And I think in, they've done a very nice job at that. So I would say, you know, to me, nothing really jumps out, but I have only two eyes, so other people see something. I think that we talked about three things then that came up, uh, not kind of typographical. Um, one was uh, the question under section one, subsection B, top of page two, whether we wanted to have a little bit more clarity about where possible being subject either to the statutory regulation or to repeat the words uh, safety liquidity yield in there. Um, the point that I raised about whether we should be doing something to add compensating balance reference in here since that's an annual town meeting action and then whether we should do something to clarify the distinction in trust funds to get OPEB um, ex at least excluded, knowing that we're going to add a section later specifically on the OPEB. Was there anything else that members of the committee recall from the discussion that we were suggesting? Because I want to thank both of you. This is a tremendous piece of work, and I think that we really appreciate what you did. I do, and I think all the committee does, and so thank you. Okay. Just want to say, I think it's extremely well written, very clear and easy to understand, and uh, gave me a really good picture of. Good. Thank you. So what we will do is um, we'll go back and make some of these changes, um, and then in terms of process, Andy, um, and. I guess maybe at our next meeting, if we have a revised version, that we'll send it out ahead of time so people can look at it. Um, maybe at that point, move forward in, in having this adopted. I think so. And I would actually be comfortable with adopting tonight's subject to uh, the changes, but uh, that was that's well, fine your too. Your pleasure. Uh, yes, we, yes. Do we have to say something about the health care claims trust? Cindy and I will talk mentioned? about whether to call that out individually as we call mm -hmm. out OPEB individually. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll figure okay. out how to do that. Okay. It, so but it, it, it was in the list of edits. And yeah. Okay. So put that in with the addition. And then we'll take, we'll just postpone for action till the next meeting then. Is that agreeable to the committee? I, I wonder, but is Nate Your Life easier to. Uh, have us prove it subject to the changes, or? Well, I know I'll be here again in the next meeting, so it doesn't matter to me. Okay, okay. <laughs> and if, if the answer is yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. And I won't make clear no, come next time. Yeah, yeah. 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 How's that? Okay. Yeah. But we, we do appreciate you being here. This has been very helpful. And that is, yeah. Claire's the explanation shows these policies are already being followed. It's not like we're adopting right. a new thing for the town. Just yeah. I, th I think that, though, um, this, I can say this to, because a lot of you were not on the Finance Committee, Kay and I were, and I think Doug might have been when we did the last round of the original policies. Uh, I think we went through a similar process where we looked at the policies in place and had recommendations from our former finance director um, for uh, a number of the policies and uh, you know it was a fairly similar process so we're just following the same process again that we used at that time and uh, He probably didn't want to take this one up at the time because he had ha happened to be treasurer also at that point. Right. <coughs> but uh, I don't know if that's true. Uh, in any event, this has been great, and thank you very much. It's a great piece of work, and I think the town really is benefiting from it, and I think that our Standard & Poor's Bond Rating Agency will appreciate the fact that we don't just stand on the financial policies, but continue to review and add and update. And, and in fact, if you look at their criteria for evaluating cities and towns, 
having financial policies, including an investment policy. And they, they listed as one of the policies you should have, so this will not help us, I, I believe. And it will be in place and adopted before they come back. Yes. So thank you. Thanks. Um, then uh, the other, the next agenda item, um, I think we don't really, I suspect we don't need much time with it, is the State Bank Warrant article that was referred to us for, um, by the last town meeting. And uh, Sandy did some research for it. Also found that, um, in fact, that had been considered by the legislature very thoroughly, and um, so I think that for the all practical matters that um, we don't need to make a recommendation of any action to town meeting, and uh, I guess my inclination would be that if I do a report as I always do to the fall town meeting on behalf of the committee, that I include all of a paragraph referring to the fact that this, uh, we've, we've learned that it's already been studied and thoroughly. Yeah, I, I would just make minimize. two points, and that is um, the town meeting article requested that we advocate to the state that the state establish a bank. Since the legislature has already looked at this, they're not going to look at it again, so there's no point in asking them. And more to the point, when they looked at it, they decided the answer was no. Um, and I think I circulated to you before uh, the report, but um, the summary of the report, just, I just wanted, if you don't mind, just take a second to talk about the reasons the report said that they didn't want to establish a state bank visit. I think maybe for people at home it would be important to know what some of those reasons were. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there is a state bank of North Dakota, and so the, both this legislative commission and the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston conducted independent studies to look at the issue of whether we should have something similar in Massachusetts. And they said no, and, and I, they, they gave five reasons. One is that... Um, a state bank would require uh, significant capitalization, so the state would have to borrow a lot of money up front to capitalize a bank, because if you have a bank, you have to have some capital. So it would have to borrow a lot of money. Um, there, uh, they pointed out that there is this North Dakota bank, but that the economies and um, the banking industries in, in Massachusetts and North Dakota are um, significantly different. North Dakota has a lot of little banks all over the place, some of which are supported by the Bank of North Dakota, but um, we just have a much more mature and varied banking industry here in Massachusetts. Um, there's the issue of risk to uh, the Commonwealth uh, for funds in a state-owned bank. Um, third is, a fourth is that um, Massachusetts has a very robust set of quasi-public agencies that invest in um, everything from housing to infrastructure to environment and so forth that, that North Dakota just doesn't have. So there are lots of places, so people who sometimes advocate for a state bank say you need it in order to do those sort of investments and we have things like mass housing and so forth that already exist. Um, and. Um, so for those reasons, um, they said that this would not be a, a good model. So I just wanted to make clear that this had been very thoroughly vetted. And um, there's a 100-page report here, which I suppose we could put the link to it, because it's uh, up on our, our web page so anybody can see it. But um, yeah. they, did a, um, they did a good job. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, what was the third reason? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, public funds of the Commonwealth would be exposed to unacceptable high risk if deposited in a state-owned bank. So that the idea is that st the state had to put its money in the state-owned bank, um, they would be subject um, to more risk than the commission thought was acceptable. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, before you found that report and sent it to it, I had done a little more looking into the Bank of North Dakota. And <laughs> like the commission, <laughs> I'm a very limited thing. It, it seemed to me that it's a completely different situation. North Dakota has a population that's about the tenth of ours. And this bank's been established since 1919, so all kinds of things have grown up. The financial system in North Dakota has grown up assuming there will be this big bank. In Massachusetts, it's a completely different, much bigger state budget in Massachusetts. Uh, the Bank of North Dakota is technically the state of North Dakota doing business as the Bank of North Dakota, and that bank is run by the governor, the attorney general, and the commissioner of agriculture. They're the overseeing board, the oversight board. So it's, um, I can only imagine how that would go over in Massachusetts. <laughs> Deciding who the governing board would be or something like that. So, and That's they, uh, and yeah. Gaming commission. What, <laughs> another thing that was mentioned in town meeting is it would be um, a, a way to keep our state tax money safer. Um, the Bank of North Dakota, in fact, according to an interview with its um, CEO uh, a couple years ago, the bank can invest in risky stuff like derivative markets and credit default swaps, but they have chosen not to so far, so there's not, it's not like they're restricted from doing it. Um, And they did have some mortgage-backed securities that they're having to work through, as he said. So um, we, we can take action as a committee. I don't think that we have to. If something is referred, we have no obligation to refer back. I think there's a courtesy we should report back. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, but if somebody felt that they wanted to make a motion for consideration by the committee, certainly there anyone in the committee is entitled to do that. What would the motion be? Well, so the motion, it, it, would, it would end up sounding, seeming a negative motion, which is why I think that it would be just, if we were going to recommend action, but we're not recommending action, so I think we would just want to report back that we looked into it as we were requested to do and considered it and feel that um, there's no appropriate action to be taken because it's That's been great. thoroughly um, studied by the Commonwealth and the Federal Reserve in Boston and, uh, okay. I move <coughs> that we take no action on this because of what you just said. Um, because it has been thoroughly studied by this commission and um, further I move that the chair write a report to town meeting to that effect and um, that we put this report up on the town website so people can refer to it, read it. Can I repeat that please? Yeah, most of us, but we take no, we, we recommend, that, or you move that we take no action on this for the um, reasons stated. No action on the, um, referral. on the referral, on, on the article that was referred to us, which I would have to look up the number of it, but. On the article referred to us? Um, yeah, I, mean, uh, yeah. I could probably tell you if I could find it. 25 or something. Article 30. That we make no recommendation on Article 30 of the 2012 Annual Town Meeting. No further recommendation. That was referred to us. Okay, we're all over here now. All right. <laughs> We make no further recommendation on Article 30. From the 2012 Annual Town Meeting. That was referred to the Finance Committee.
Okay, we, <clears throat> we make no further recommendation on Article 30 from the spring, is it? <clears throat> 2012 yeah. Annual Town Meeting. Spring. 2012 Annual okay. Town Meeting. 2012 Annual Town Meeting. <clears throat> that was referred to the Finance Committee. I wrote a little bit more because what Kay had said is that uh, she moved for the reasons that I stated, so right. it has to occur, and I can give you the language All later. Right. Yeah, because we but several things have been. Was, but it was essentially that the motion is that the Finance Committee recommends no action on uh, Article 30 of the 2012 Annual Town Meeting because the matter has been thoroughly considered by the Legislature and the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, both of which recommended not to establish a Bank of Massachusetts. Is there anything else you want to add to that? <laughs> How's your chance? No, that sounds good. And because uh, you had also done some additional yeah. research. Right. Well, but they pretty much covered it in their report. Okay. I'll second. So it's uh, second by Doug. Motion uh, by Kay. Any further discussion on the motion? All in favor indicate by raising hands. Seven. So seven zero. It's unanimous. Uh, and if we, if there is a link, we'll try and put it in. It's a long document to try and otherwise put onto our own website. Yeah, it's 100 pages. I don't but if there's, a, but if there's a link, there to is a link. It, so that should take care of. Uh, so then uh, we're getting onto the finance committee articles for the fall town meeting, uh, and this is uh, uh, also in the nature of. Budget coordinating group report from this morning, and uh, because the recommendation was made by uh, town manager and finance director um, to both, and uh, so now you're going to hear what you missed before. So that was Dr. to Bob. Uh, these are all, some of are two-sided and some are stapled together, but it's all the same document. I think the thing is, just a go ahead, I have a, uh, yeah, the I went from earlier today. Two-sided or the one? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I tried to comply with the town's policy of two-sided, but I hit the wrong button when I printed some of these. <laughs> Andy, do you want to recap, or do you want me to go through this? How, how, what's your pleasure? Um, well, you can go through it. Um, there, there are two actions. I, I can just start. There are two actions that are, that are being recommended, and uh, I actually did meet earlier in the week with um, John and Sandy and Stephanie. We, so we did kind of review this, and... Uh, what is recommended comes out of that meeting and is two actions to uh, take place. But um, why don't you go ahead then? Okay, with that thank you. Introduction. Um, so, yeah, there are two actions. One has to do with sort of aligning our reserves, and the other has to do with funding OPEB. Um, so, um, the town financial policies, which I've quoted. Uh, excerpts from at the top here say two things. One is that um, our reserves, which are defined as uh, the combination of our free cash and our stabilization fund, should be between 5 and 15 percent of our general fund um, revenue. And the second thing it says is that our free cash, that one component of the reserves, um, should be equal to at least 5% of our general fund revenue, and that if free cash comes in in excess of that 5% mark, we may move the excess into the stabilization fund. So we now have a, an estimate for what our free cash is going to be. And I would emphasize at this point it's an estimate because Sonia has 
submitted the paperwork to the state for certification, they always change something. <laughs> so these numbers aren't exact. Um, but once we get the numbers back, um, and we will be able to incorporate something in a um, or an article. But we had an FY13 general fund operating budget of sixty-six million four hundred eighty-one thousand dollars. Five percent of that is three point three million. Sonia's mm -hmm. initial free cash estimate is four point five million, so that there is strictly speaking one point two million available um, to. Um, which we may move from free cash to stabilization. And that is, in fact, what we're suggesting that we do. And what I would have you look at are the charts on the second page. Uh, there are two charts here. They're, they're both the same numbers. One has more colors than the other um, to make a point. So if you look at the bottom one where it says free cash and stabilization, if you look at our overall reserve funds over the years, you see that um, we've gone through kind of a trough here, a valley, from the early 2000s, um, where the town had um, almost $9 million in reserves. And for various reasons, um, which those of you who have been involved in finance committee and town meeting know from first-hand experience better than I, but the town had to draw down those reserves until a point in uh, 2006 where there really wasn't any more to responsibly draw down. And so reserves stayed level for about uh, five years after that. And then starting in 2011, 12, and 13, what we're looking at is starting to build our reserves back up. And again, just keeping in mind the reason we have these reserves, and it's part of our policy here, I, I didn't re replicate it in the memo, but the idea is that we know there are economic cycles, and invariably there will be downturns. And so when we can, we should build, be building up our reserves. Um, so that's the big picture of what our overall level would be. Up above, the one with the, the different colors shows the ratio between the blue lines, which were free cash, red lines, which were stabilization, and, and then green, which is what we're suggesting, this transfer between free cash and stabilization be this year. And so you can see that um, up until 2005, there was a substantial amount of stabilization funds, and then it was really drawn down <coughs> until 2009 when it was less than a million dollars, and it slowly built up uh, a little bit more. Uh, Last year we put in another 400,000, so 1.8 million in stabilization now. And if we make this transfer, stabilization will be uh, just over $3 million, 4.7% of the general fund budget. And if we add the free cash amount at 5%, it means that our total reserves will be 9.7, which, as John Misanti and his uh, love of baseballs, said uh, really sort of hits a sweet spot right in the middle of our goals. <laughs> so um, that would be the recommendation is to is as well as we have the opportunity um, to build up uh, the stabilization fund and to keep mon a substantial amount of money in there that we do that at fall town meeting. Um, the second part is to start to fund OPEP. Uh, as you remember from last spring, when we passed the budget, we knew that the legislature was considering giving us more state aid. And we went through an extensive discussion about, you know, should we spend it or not spend it, or, or what should we do with it? And, and I think the, con the consensus from the Finance Committee was that if we do get it, we don't spend it in FY13 because we already had a balanced budget and that we use that to put into our reserve somehow. And um, the suggestion is that the reserve that we put it into is the OPEB, which really is one of one form of, of town reserves. Uh, we have um, $585,000 worth of sort of excess state aid um, that um, is available to us. Uh, and we really need to do something with it before or at fall town meeting so that we continue to have a balanced budget. 
because now we have more revenue than we have expenditures. So we need. So if we expend this money by putting it into the OPEP fund, what it will do is will fund um, the town of Amherst and the Amherst Elementary School portions of their OPEP liabilities. Um, there's still a liability and a funding need for the regional schools. But they're still sort of going through their discussion about what they want to do. Um, and um, as best as what, what we discussed at uh, BCG this morning was that uh, some of the towns that are, the other towns like Pelham and um, Tewksbury uh, that are in the region have set aside money for their own town OPEB, but not for regional OPEB yet. Um, so the suggestion is that we put this money aside for the Amherst and the elementary school portion of OPEB. At some point, we're going to need to continue to deal with the, the regional uh, OPEB liability, but um, we'll get to that down the road. I think this would be a good start. Um, it is somewhat of a drop in the bucket, but it is a good drop. Um, and I think down the road, either in the FY14 or maybe FY15 budget, um, depending on how things look, we need to start putting money in on a regular basis every year. Um, but as long as we have this one-time source, um, the recommendation is to put it in now. So those are the two action items that uh, I think we need to take a position on and do something about for fall town meeting. Bring that was great. Uh, on the reporting on the consensus discussion this morning at the budget coordinating group, as you know, the budget coordinating group does not actually vote positions as, uh, because it, it's a collective body of the various budget authorities, but the collective judgment was supportive of doing both of these motions. There was some discussion about OPEB and um, you know, some questions that were raised um, about um, OPEB and the comfort level with it, but in the end, the, the discussion for various reasons came out in favor of uh, both of those. And I won't try and torture the details of that discussion here. Uh, so that's... Uh, I just one question, anticipating the discussions at town meeting, if, if I raise my hand in town meeting and I say, okay, uh, are we going to be sorry that we allocated this 585 in state aid? Is it a use it or lose it situation? No, it's not. It's this is our cash. And the impulse to conserve that for some other use, I'm sure, will be voiced. <coughs> And I, I'm just wondering how we answer that question. Well, so I think the alternative would we could appropriate it into the stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I think given that we are making ste good, steady progress in increasing um, our reserves mm -hmm. here, um, you know, I, I think we're going in the right direction and, and it's adequate. I mean, if we had more money, we'd go okay. but, but, but and um, this is a liability that uh, is out there. It, it, it is a sort of reserve fund that we're putting money into and, and it's protecting us against uh, kind of a, a very big ongoing liability that's out there that we're going to have to deal with one way or the other. Um, you know, along the same lines, you know, we are, this is what my, you know, Correct me if I'm wrong. The this is a one-time state aid, additional state aid we got. The, you know this 585 number. This is not a recurring thing. Is Actually, it, I, I will correct you on that. It, it I believe it will be. Re, it is recurring. I, in other words, I believe that we will get that money again in FY14. That's in 15 and 16. Can you predict that? I mean, are you that confident? It is not unheard of for the state to reduce state aid. It happened under Governor Romney. Um, but it's unusual. Um, mostly, if they can help it, they don't cut state aid. Um, 
in building the FY14 budget, as you'll see on October 11th, I'm taking this money for 14 and building it into the base and assuming that that will be there. And that that is going to be a substantial part of what enables us to have a balanced, reasonable yeah. budget for well, 14. Well, here's, you know, here's my thought. You know, um, there's an OPEB, and that's probably a dis different discussion at some point uh, we would probably have. Uh, the OPEB is this big liability sitting out there, and we want to start funding it in some fashion. We, to me, you know, I understand what you're saying, but to me, it still is, feels, feels like a found money here yeah, that we are okay. putting into OPEB. Yes. Uh, would it not be more prudent to just uh, have a line item on the expenditure side in the budget so that money just goes there on a regular basis? Right now, the main concern that I seem I have is that the OPEB library is invisible. Uh, and things which are invisible don't get attention. So if we put that a line item in the expenditure side so that every year people see it, what am I missing it? You're not missing anything yet because you haven't seen anything that has it, but okay. if you see on my draft for going forward, yeah, I have an OPEB line. There's no money in it yet. Okay. <clears throat> but when we get... That's the op operating budget? Yes. Okay. Right. It's for future use. So it's... Uh, it's sort of the new, uh, in addition to the lines that have previously been there, this is actually uh, something that we discussed at that meeting with, uh, that I, I attended with uh, Ms. O'Keefe and Mr. Misanti and Sandy. So, yeah, so going around the table, so Janice, Doug, and Kay. Um, is there going to be another review of our OPEB liability? I thought they had to do it every so many years. Every two years. In fact, we met with, we just put out an RFP and selected an actuary. We met with Sonia and I and her staff uh, and um, Deb and, and uh, Case Slogar and Deb Radway and I met with him yesterday morning to have the prelim preliminary meeting to talk about gathering data and who's going to get the records to him and so forth and what assumptions uh, he's recommends and we need to approve that he use in that study. So uh, yes, we're having another study done. Um, it will take about a month and a half to get that back. Um, part of what we put out in the RFP this year was a request not only that he um, do a study, but that he help us do some what-if scenarios. What if we put in $500,000 this year? What if we start by $100,000 a year and, you know, going forward and so forth? And, and uh, what effect that will have on our liabilities over the long run? So uh, my hope is that by working with him, we can do a bit. I did a model for you guys last year about yes. some funding. And, you know, I thought it was a good crude start, mm -hmm. but I... I the more I dealt with it, the more I felt I really needed some expertise from an actuary as to make sure we were doing this right. So what I'm hoping is that um, later this uh, fall or this winter, uh, before the you know, town meeting, we'll have gone through some of that what-if exercise and be able to show the implications of, of funding. Doug? So the, the thing I was just going to say, follow up on Enron's, I mean, we've the, I think we've discussed in, in our meetings having um, you know, OPEB be a, a line item in the budget. I mean, with, certainly within the last year or so, we've had that conversation, and, and it would be similar to uh, the the payment we make to the uh, Hampshire County Retirement. Exactly. So it's the same idea, except that one's mandated more so than this is. This is would be self mandated, but again, it's like you say, it's one of those things that's it's a while the actual dollar amount that is out there is subject to some debate, depending on your assumptions of what the future holds, it's not zero, and we know that, so we've got to start planning and building for that. So I think that, yeah, the sooner we can start making a part of the base budget conversation, the better. Okay. Um, I want some of you to cast your minds back to some last summer, um, 2011, when we had an OPEP subcommittee that met. Mm -hmm. Bob, Doug, and me. Sandy was there with us, and we uh, somewhat rashly voted to rec <laughs> at the time to recommend putting five hundred thousand from free cash mm -hmm. into OPEP at at that fall town meeting just to get it going. And 
and then to start a funding schedule beginning with fiscal 13, which we haven't done yet. But um, I, I am wholly in support of putting this um, excess state aid that we did not put into the operating budget into the LPAP fund. Um, yeah. I think that there are town meeting members who are very supportive of this. In fact, one asked why it isn't a line item in the budget, even if you put a zero by it, because they believe it should be. The, they didn't want a zero by it, but what they're saying is that, that we have to wake up to the fact that this is something we need. And I would think with what's happening to those towns that are going bankrupt, mainly because of unfunded liabilities, that people shouldn't have missed that over the summer if they were reading anything. Um, I mean, that's why, Bob, you had raised the question as we started the round of, uh, and about uh, what if somebody from town meeting was going to say, was going to raise questions about it. That kind of came up this morning at the budget coordinating group. And I think that uh, the prevailing sentiment of the group was that, uh, and remember, these are people who are very interested in the operating budgets too because there are people from the library trustees and the library director, superintendent was there and school committee members and they're all so, you know, it's not considered lightly. The recognition is that um, we do have a liability uh, regardless of what happens with our future decisions on the OPEB Trust and even if um, we use the money in the end for um, our annual pay-as-we-go expenditures, it is money that is not going to, it's not disappearing, it's just another form of reserves that we're putting it in, but it's, it's an earmarked reserve, but there's no future expense against it that's much greater than the amount that we're suggesting to put in. I think that's kind of what the response is to town meeting. Um, and the other thing I was going to just say is, is that one of the things that we haven't really talked about again that did come up the other day in uh, smaller meeting is the strategic question as to whether we should have the OPEB article come first and have the free cash to stabilization come second with the recommend with the um, actual wording of the article uh, an amount from st um, stabilization without naming the amount so that if um, town meeting were to have hesitations about OPEB we can still make the motion to add it to stabilization um, because we think it needs to get into some type of reserves. We'd like to make the statement, I think, of getting it into OPEB to start mo movement in doing that. Um, but um, most of all, we want to make sure that it stays in reserves. So that was just a strategic question of how to approach it. Mary Lynn. Um. I know town employees are part of this. The library has to set up its own OPEB? Or do no, they? the town basically play, pays for the t library employees. That, oh, they do. Yeah. Okay, so they're in, they're in with the town. The only ones that are not part of this are the regional school schools. That's right. That's right. Okay. And the four towns are going to share that, and that's why it came up in the discussion in a four towns meeting last year, and I'm sure we'll be in a four towns meeting again this year. And, and I just one other point that Stephanie made at PCG today is is that um, at some point when we do deal with the region, um, we're not precluded from catch, catching up the region so that it so that everybody's kind of growing up the same. So if we're putting stuff aside for the town now and we have to do some catch up with the region later, we can do that. Um, so. Okay. And that's yet another argument for putting this other money into the stabilization fund because if we get to the point where we want to catch up the regional OPEB fund, we could take money from stabilization for that. We would have to set it aside already. The way we did last year, we set some money aside for when we wanted to start funding OPEB. Can I have a really quick follow-up question? Uh, just to, uh, the 585, um, is that enough? 
or I mean, on, on a regular basis. I mean, is do we have a sense of how fast that number is growing? Oh, okay. I mean, is it growing faster than five eighty five a year, or is it growing a much uh, uh, much smaller? In the last uh, actuarial report, the uh, annual amount that we need to, to put aside for uh, what's called our ARC annual required contribution uh, was about two million dollars a year. You can subtract out from that what you pay every year on, on a pay-as-you-go basis for your, your retiree's health insurance, so uh, which is about a million dollars. I think I have the numbers right. Okay. Um, well, that's fine. Okay. And um, so that means that leaves a million. Right. So this would be half a million. So you're kind of halfway there. I mean, quite frankly. <coughs> um, this is a one-time jump start. Um, if we put something into the annual operating budget, I think that it will probably start out at a much lower number, like $100,000 a year. We're not going to be hitting our, our arc. We're not going to be meeting the annual amount we need to contribute anytime soon. It's going to take a while to get there, and, and I think ultimately the way we're going to get there is we're going to... Um, fully fund our pension obligations and then divert that money over toward, um, toward OPEP. Mm. Um, so if we're to fully fund, and by the way, I, I know of only one community, maybe two, in the Commonwealth that's fully funding its ARC now. I believe that's Needham. Um, and for a variety of reasons they're able to do it. Um, nobody else is, is hitting their ARC. There are, other communities that are quite wealthy communities that are doing the same sort of thing, making drops in the bucket now with the idea that down the road they'll be able to do more. Yeah. Just, just a quick comment. Honorog should see the uh, that canned presentation that was given to us a year ago on mm -hmm. OPEP. Um, the PowerPoint, is that around anywhere? Yes, it's on the town website. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So the, the question then is, uh, well, this is probably not the right forum to discuss that. Maybe at some point when we are spending more time directly on it, um, is there any advantage to not putting the the money we are putting in the stabilization stabilization fund? Uh, is it, is there any advantage to not taking some of that and making this a million? <coughs> um, I think that um, I think it's important to continue to build up our our reserves, the combination of free cash and stabilization, uh, because at some point we may need to draw on that to, to protect the operating budget. So I would, um, I think we need to continue to make progress on, on, on this curve. Here. Okay. I move that we, uh, Recommend to Fall Town Meeting um, that Fall Town Meeting appropriate $585,342 to the OPEP fund. Second. And, and can I just say that that number will be contingent? No, no, I'm sorry, that, that number that's is. That's not yeah. the contingent that's number, that. right? That's, that's right. That that's number right. Is sorry, I got ahead of myself. That's the real number. So you move Town Meeting to appropriate the $5 million right. to 585000 oh, to the OPEP. Yeah. To the OPEP Trust. To the OPEP, OPEP Trust, Trust Fund. OPEP oh. Trust Fund. That's been, I think it was Kay and Bob seconded, if I recall correctly. Okay, so we have a motion on the further discussion on the motion. All in favor indicate by raising hand. So it's seven, and it's seven zero on this one. And uh, at this point, I don't know what to say about an amount for stabilization because we. Well, uh, I, I guess I would suggest that there could be a motion to support transferring um, the excess of free cash over and above 5% to stabilization. 
in conformity with the town financial policies. So moved. <laughs> Great. You want to write that out, please? <laughs> How can we type so fast? <laughs> I, will, I will. Can I send you an email? Do you yes, want to write yes, it you may. You may send me an email. Okay, so that, somebody made that motion. I did. Doug made that motion. And the, Just to clarify, to appropriate the excess of free cash over 5% of the operating budget. Yep, in accordance with the financial policies. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's uh, the, the uh, policy is written as general fund operating revenues. So if you're going to follow the policy. General fund operating revenues. In as much as I know that they always have to be in balance and be equal to each other. <laughs> it's the shorthand, but you're right. Okay. So... Doug made the motion. Kay, did you second or Janice, uh, Janice seconded? Okay. So we know what the motion is, and uh, I guess the only thing that I would point out is the question that I raised earlier as to whether um, it should actually be. Uh, but I guess we can hold off on that. I was thinking as if uh, we wanted to, if we want to reserve. The actual motion uh, until after we know what the town meeting does on the OPEB. Ah. So, but but I think that it's fair because that we want to do at least the excess of. Right. So, it could be a, in the end a higher amount. So I think the motion is perfect. So, any further discussion on the motion? Not all in favor, raise hand. Seven zero. Okay. Um, I will keep you informed as to how the process of that goes forward. Uh, budget calendar. Look, another colorful document. So I have amended this since this morning oh, uh, because I've gotten feedback from Maria and from uh, Sharon. Okay. This is a draft budget calendar. Um, you've seen it in past years. Um, so we're trying to anticipate when actions are going to happen in the coming year. So just a quick overview, the letters that are in black represent town actions. Purple are for the library and the trustees. Red is for the regional school committee and blue is for the Amherst school <coughs> committee. Um, so just without going through every single line here, I just point out a few key dates. Um, one is October 11th. That's when we present preliminary um, projections for FY14. Um, I'll do a revenue forecast and um, along with our financial indicators report. So that's an important meeting uh, that uh, the Finance Committee, Select Board, School Committee, and Library Trustees will attend. It will be broadcast uh, on Amherst Media, and it really starts the process of um, giving specific numbers to each of those entities to be able to, to move forward. So, um, then, uh, the Finance Committee will look at those numbers, discuss them, and come out with some budget guidelines for um, the town, the schools, and the region. Uh, that will happen um, by the end of October, or first meeting in November. Um, in the meantime, uh, starting at the end of October and going through uh, mid-November, the department heads will meet with me and John, and uh, they'll put in their budget requests to us, and, and we will start sorting out um, their, their requests. Uh, we then have uh, the school committee will be doing its own process, uh, which will lead to votes in uh, late winter. One thing that's interesting this year is that the library trustees 
have changed their process. Um, it used to be that they would come up with a budget and then decide on a spending rate out of their endowment. They've now flipped that. They've decided what their spending rate is so they know how much money they're going to have. And now they're going to develop a budget based on a known amount of, of money from, from their endowment and then ultimately from the town. Um, so they are thinking that their budget process is going to be much more like the town departments and they will have a budget done uh, by the beginning of the year as opposed to February, March, where sometimes they've done in the past. So I think that's a, an ambitious and positive development. Um, the next l legally significant date is that on January 16th, the, uh, for the Amherstown Government Act, the town manager will present his FY14 budget, um, deliver it to the um, select board and the finance committee, uh, and then we go through all the, the budget hearings, uh, culminating in town meetings starting on uh, May 6th, uh, and then a lot of other stuff in the middle. So this is a draft. I, I, I think it, after th this morning's meeting um, and getting some feedback from Maria and Sharon, I think this is really starting to gel. Um, it also has things like the four town meetings for the regional school budget in here. Those have been, I think, set now. Um, so uh, I will post this on uh, October 11th when we do the um, financial indicators report. This will go up on the town website for everybody to see. Um, any questions or comments? So I would just ask if you just please look it over if you, you see anything that you think uh, needs to change or comments or scheduling conflicts, but otherwise this is what we'll go with. Okay. Has select board set a, a date for the town election yet? Yes, I believe that they have said it is um, April 9th and it's on here. Oh, yes, it is. It is. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Andy, could you just tell us what meetings we have as a finance committee between now and that's January? Good. That's sort of the next agenda item, oh, actually. Okay. And that's good. Oh. So maybe we can just, if, every, if nobody else has questions, we'll just segue right into responding. Right. There we go. Uh, any other questions on right now? Because otherwise, if you have thoughts about the calendar, questions about the calendar that you can't pose today because you haven't thought of them, on Sandy. So, hearing nothing along those lines, we'll go straight into responding to uh, Mary Lou's very good question and to the next agenda item. Uh, okay. There are a couple things that we need to be aware of. November 1st is the date that's on here, is the, is the target date that we want to have the um, preliminary guidelines from our committee um, available and uh, given the very ambitious schedule that everybody else is committing to, I think it would be good for us to try and adhere to that. Um, a second point that I want to make is uh, October 11th, as you know, is the four board meeting that uh, we have every year. In prior years, we've uh, then gone off into another room and continued to meet and actually tried to hear from about fall town meeting warrant articles and do all sorts of other stuff. Uh, we may not need to do that this year unless people are really dying to or feel strongly about taking advantage of being all together in town hall on the same night anyway, because this year the fall town meeting is starting much later than it normally starts. As you know, it's November 19th is the start date for the fall town meeting. So the whole consideration of fall town meeting articles is actually going to be on a slightly delayed calendar from where it has been in prior years. And uh, the, the reason for that uh, has to do with the uh, the clerk being tied up with uh, some minor election that happens earlier in November um, and uh, then the holiday that falls in there. But anyway, that is when town meeting will begin. So to get back to the question at hand, 
Uh, we do have a meeting on October 11th, we know about. Um, we could continue meeting that evening, or we could meet on the 18th um, of October um, and have a really substantive meeting in which we then have an opportunity to give thought to the presentation that we've had and then um, have a substantial discussion of it and really take that into um, develop preliminary guideline, um, which we then can come back to and approve at a November 1st meeting, which would also give us a chance on November 1st possibly to deal start dealing with town meeting articles. So I guess the, my recommendation would be to, to not, uh, to just meet for the purposes of the four board meeting on the 11th to recommend meetings on the 18th and November 1st, and um, then we probably need to at least hold open the possibility of a November 8th meeting if it's needed, if there are so many uh, warrant articles that we have to meet again, but I think it would be our desire to not have to do that. Yes? Um, I'm away on the 18th. And I can't come that night. And I'm away on the 11th and the 18th. Well, when the 18th doesn't work, how about the 25th? I'm back. Darn it. That's my birthday. I was really hoping we could meet then. <laughs> and bring a cake. We'll bring we'll a cake. Celebrate your birthday. <laughs> Is that a no then, Sandy? No, no, I... I okay, so well, we're I, not... I have no idea. Okay, is, so, is so and of course, the 11th, um, Mary Lou, the 11th is set. That, that, I, I know, uh, and, and set, mine has yeah. been set for some time, so... So, um, um, so therefore, um, the four board meeting is done. But, so we're not meeting on the 18th. The 25th, that, did you say? We're going to meeting on the 25th and the 1st. Right. And our goal is on the 25th to try and process the information from the 11th and to develop preliminary guidelines and to begin consideration. Um, and then hopefully we can finish up on the 1st. We'll reserve the 8th and we can hopefully cancel one of those two dates, the 1st to the 8th, but see how the process and schedule works out. So if we could hold the dates, but the goal is to not meet on all on both the 1st and the 8th, um, we can avoid it. Okay. Why did I write Finance Committee question mark on Thursday, September 27th? Did we ever talk about that? Yes, at one point that had been a possible date. So I can just cross that out. Uh, yes. Uh, you want to meet? You're welcome to it. I'll be in Rochester, New York that weekend. Uh, I don't think there's a reason to meet. Okay. I just think it was a possible date that had been discussed a few yeah, months right. ago. Yeah. 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 Came to uh, okay. So, uh, and then of course we know we have town meeting, and we um, always reserve the possibility of meeting on the evenings of town meeting sessions as the need arises. Anything else on schedule right now as we got far enough to, for the time being? Are we going to continue meeting the second Thursday of every month, which would put us to December 13th? I mean, are these tentative that you mark in so people can plan around that? We, I mean, the question of a December meeting, I mean, it, once the town meeting is done and we're sort of, and we've issued our preliminary guidelines, um, and knowing that starting with uh, the issuance of the town manager's budget, which will also be the date we promised the library budget, and hopefully very quickly thereafter, school budgets, we're going to be meeting every Thursday, just about after that in January. So, Holding off and not meeting in December. And that, that's okay. I just wondered when we would talk about some process in terms of meeting with uh, department heads again, clarifying maybe.
thinking about a little bit more about what we would ask, um, you know, that sort of thing. Let's try and do that if we can. We'll, we'll reserve the possibility of scheduling a December meeting, but let's see if we can do that in um, one of our October no sure. or November meetings. Because I think it's a good point you raised, and I appreciate you bringing it up. I don't think we need to wait that long. It can come up. Sure. Actually, to the extent that we can have that discussion and incorporate it into the guideline, preliminary guidelines letter, we're giving notice to that the parties sense. of what it is that we're expecting to cover. So I think it's a good discussion to have then. Sure. So does that sound like a reasonable plan that everybody comfortable with? Okay. I just want to clarify. So we're definitely going to meet October 11th and October the 25th. Correct. November 1 or 8th are tentative. We're asking that both dates be held, and right. we're in, uh, but we're hoping that we only have to meet on one of the two dates. Okay. Because I let uh, know from the yeah. Gazette, and I have to <clears throat> let, her, let her know ahead of time. So I can give her at least the 11th and the 25th. Right. And I'll hold on the other two until the 25th when we know. Uh, well, we don't have meeting rooms yet. Uh, she doesn't put meeting rooms. She just says town hall. <coughs> I think that uh, we have to go back and double check. I know that we've reserved a lot of Thursdays at town hall. <coughs> In the first floor meeting room, as we always do it, we actually had it tonight, as you know. Mm -hmm. Chose not to use it, but we did have it. Okay, anything else? Um, member reports, liaisons, and committees. I do have one. Let's we'll see if others. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Hope I survive the rest of the time without having water. Got for water. Um, Regional School District Planning Board. Um, the planning board has decided that the logical step would be to have an additional four town meeting similar to the four town meetings that we have over budgets, in which we ask select boards, finance committees, um, and uh, school committees, and other um, senior officials from all of the towns to attend so that we can talk about the whole concept of regionalizing either the elementary schools or expanding the current region to a pre-K-12 region. And uh, that uh, the, is sort of a preliminary way to get every um, all of the people who are in leadership positions from the various towns in the same place to talk about it. Uh, we have set a date for that, November 3rd. It is Saturday. Will be at the middle school, and uh, we have invited uh, legislators and Representative Kulik will represent the House of Representatives, and Senator Rosenberg is going to be there to represent the Senate uh, because the uh, legislature is very interested in what they can do to support a regionalization process such as is being discussed. Uh, so I just wanted to report that so that all of you, because you're on the Finance Committee, uh, can uh, get that on your calendar Saturday, November 3rd. I think we have 9 o'clock in the morning is the time, which is the standard time that we always have uh, four town meetings. Uh, so it'll be the same kind of setup, but a, uh, not budget this time. It's a different topic. Did you say you had a location for that? Sorry. Yeah, the Library. middle school. Okay. Middle school library. <clears throat> so, um, that's my latest on report. Uh, is there anything else? Okay. The Joint Capital Planning Committee met first to just familiarize everybody. We have two new members. We may have yet another new member. <laughs> if the library trustees get another new member. And then um, we'll meet again in um, October to talk about uh, proposals for fall town meeting. There was a vote, a recommendation. James voted chair. Yes. <laughs> on the. Uh, oh, study. there was a recommendation. Yes, to in, it was a. It was a preliminary, tentative recommendation. Um, That's right. 
unanimous but very preliminary to recommend increasing the percent of the levy used for capital from what was used this year. It's more of, a, of an opinion, really, than it was <laughs> sort of a like recommendation. A, a, a goal. Our, our, newest, <laughs> our newest member on the committee said she had a hard time voting for it because she still knew she didn't really know what's going on. So, but she did. We, we brought her this anyway. <laughs> <That's laughs> way. This is the Joint Planning Committee? Joint Capital, capital Planning. Planning Committee. Joint Capital Planning. Okay. So what was the recommendation? To do what? To an increase, to recommend increasing the percentage of the levy that we use for capital. From, from what to what? 6.5 percent of the tax levy to 7 percent of the tax levy. And what were the rationale for the recommendation? The that we town don't have enough. Policy okay. says that we should be spending 10 percent. and. We haven't for many years, but we've been trying to move it up. Okay. okay. And of course, what will happen is is that um, we presume that on October 11, that you will provide information that this committee will then be able to consider on the 25th as to whether that is something that is feasible to do because we would have to then build it into what we do in our preliminary guidelines. Exactly. <clears throat> so that's where it goes from here. Anything else in liaison? Yes. Oh, I just want to know, am I still the liaison to the library? Yes. I missed the last meeting. Yes, thank you. Um, in school liaison, do we have a second school liaison to... Uh, Who's that? Well, you're one, aren't you? I'm one and two. No, the question is who's number two? Do we have a number two? I'm not sure that we... It's not hard to follow them. Um, so, because you're already doing the library, so... Yeah. It, it really is a, a difficult, I don't mind. And I look now. I look on the uh, agenda to see if they're going to talk about budget. And if they are, I go, and I don't have to stay for the whole thing. Or if I miss it, if they do, you know, the uh, Amherst Media has it. But I never speak with them anyway. I don't. I. I really don't feel comfortable <coughs> doing that. I think you do that at the budget coordinating group. I mean, that's plenty of information for them. Uh, they have a chance to come to the uh, presentation by the manager. So unless they ask me a question, which is, what's the date of something, which I feel confident to answer. Otherwise, I, I just sit and listen. Well, if you're comfortable um, handling both school committees, regional and elementary, for budget purposes, uh, since we haven't seen a volunteer raising hands and I haven't called on anybody to volunteer, uh, I think that the, the alternative is if you need help, you should call either another member of the committee or call me to call another member of the committee because you may have a date you can't cover that you think is an important need or something like that. Uh, but we'll leave it at that. Oh okay. yeah, I can be a backup if you want. All right. Be. All right. Um, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so I'm not sure who's doing what this year. Like people's pretty. I know Janice is doing the library. Uh, yeah, Bob and I are again doing uh, the uh, budget coordinating group, and Doug and Kay are again doing joint capital planning. And Bob and uh, Bob is serving on the audit committee for the. FY11 audit. Okay. I'm happy to volunteer for something. Well, if you want to do work on the, uh, do, do the schools, sure. and you can talk to Mary Lou about what's involved. The schools are, um, it's a big topic. It's interesting. I actually find, find that that was a good way to get involved when I first came onto the committee. Um, and this guy can't do it because he's got a conflict. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that that pretty well covers it unless we have minutes. We do. Okay. I have another question. Um, is the re regional uh, 
group going to give a report at the fall town meeting. Uh, and I ask that because having attended the few that I could before summer started, there are very few people who come to them. It's the same people, three of us or four. Uh, so it would seem to me that it's an extremely important item for town meeting and that maybe they could give an update at the fall town meeting. The answer is yes. Good. Good. Um, the Regional School District Planning Committee has now been combined with the other three towns Regional School District Planning Committees and uh, for some obscure reason that I'm still trying to understand, I agreed to chair that board, what's now a Regional School District Planning Board, which is a four-town board. So uh, I'm sure that one of the three of us who's on from Amherst on the committee will be reporting and we will do a written report as uh, Catherine Oppie did at the last annual okay. town meeting. Okay, minutes. Okay. Well, we have a set from July 12th that I sent out then, but I haven't sent it out since, so I uh, people remember. Not, I can send you out again for our next meeting. July 12th meeting? Yep. Okay. So it's up to the, uh, the group as to whether you'd like to take the draft up now or we'll... Did you get any comments back from anybody? No. Okay. Uh, did I get some back from you, Sandy? I <clears throat> think so, but I, think, I don't I remember. Think I did. But I can't remember either. So you don't. You guys don't okay, so, yeah. so we'll, uh, we'll postpone until the next meeting. I'll send them out again before the next meeting. But make sure you check to see about Sandy and kind of I'll take a look. Everybody should take a look again if you just have any last comments, but do it soon before you forget about it. Uh, and uh, since there's nothing that was not reasonably anticipated, except the Sandy's birthday. Yes, but it's always a disgrace. Yeah, right. He has one every year. That's right. I tried it. Wow. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'll move we adjourn. Good idea, thank you. Second. Second. And duly noted that we are to the nine twenty and uh Amherst Media, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank everybody at home. Uh, we appreciate your interest in finance committee.